So how many of you have read one paragraph, one single paragraph that's changed your life? How many of you have read one, one paragraph at all? Cool. That's amazing that you're here and you've only read one paragraph. I'm impressed. An excerpt, if you will. The coming of night is a time of awakening on the strangler fig. The protective cloak of dusk, heralded by swelling choruses of crickets and frogs, releases a new set of shapes onto the tree's surface. Ominous creatures, black as the night and looking like flattened hybrids between a crab and a spider, ease noiselessly from their narrow crevices. These are amblypigids, the nocturnal masters of the Matapalo trunk. And you can see here, this note I took over two years ago, it says, these are super cool, amblypigids. And I even spelled it wrong, even though it was written on the page in front of me. But you know, I've been a bio nerd my whole life. I've been obsessed with the diversity of form and function of creatures around me. That's a fancy way of saying it. But really all I did after reading this page was Google it and see pictures like this and said, what? What are these things? Are you kidding me? They live on the same planet that we do? They're over 300 million years old as a group? They're older than the dinosaurs? What? And sure, they're striking enough as is just looking at them. But then I started reading published papers on there uh, and <laughs> they communicate in a way that you can't even fathom. You know, so first, they have these spiked face claws in the front. They're pedipalps they use to capture prey. And they literally just grab things with them and just start crunching on them. They spew digestive juices on them. They break it down. They slurp it up into their bodies. And their front legs, so all arachnids have eight legs. These guys are arachnids. But their front legs are, have evolved into these antennae-like structures. They're called antenniform legs. And they're a lot like if you had walking sticks at the front of your body that were covered in fingers and tongues and noses. They can smell. They can and taste, they can touch, all with their front legs. And the way that they're used in communication especially is particularly fascinating. Um, so say you have two males, two females who are competing over a particular resource, say a nice place to hide, a nice nook or cranny. Again, they're super flat. They can duck into any little nook, cranny, crevice between a rock, a hard place, anything. And they might start by tapping each other with their antenna form legs, a little tap, kind of see what's up. Oh, hey, how's it going? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I like you very much. And then all of a sudden, they'll start to vibrate their legs. And they're actually beginning to vibrate their legs at frequencies that produce movement in the air. That's so close by, it, it only affects highly sensitive uh, hairs sticking out of their legs and causes the neurons in those, in those hairs to fire repeatedly. And all of a sudden, they start building up. And they vibrate faster and faster and faster. And all of a sudden, they start fencing. They'll lean back and forth, vibrating one leg at each other. And then they'll keep one pedipalp open, like they're bearing a shield at each other. They lean back and forth. And then all of a sudden, they'll start using both legs. And they'll start vibrating both of them at each other. And they'll raise up on their, on their walking legs. And then they'll open their pedipalps and they'll fight each other. It's like Godzilla meets War of the Worlds meets sumo wrestling. And they'll throw each other asunder. And as soon as I saw that, it was a thing that that exists. It's just like... I need to figure out how. I need to figure out why. How is this even a possibly a thing? And this has been going on millions of years, hundreds of millions of years. Because for me, I think, honestly, this is all just a rationalization that I really like to talk. And I'm glad you're all listening to me right now. <laughs> um, but I study communication because it's ubiquitous. It's something that we all do, that we do every day. But that happens between all types of animals. But that happens between all types of life. That happens in our cells. Our cells are communicating in these tiny little compartments. And yet this happens at a scale between animals in a way so specific, too. Something about their environment, the way they interact with their environment, the way they interact with each other, has led them to have this wild type of body and this wild means of communicating with each other. And so again, I want to just get into that in some particular way. And my first experience in working with them is really what convinced me to kind of stay on this track. It's what's brought me here to UNL. And the, re the book that I read that I promptly threw on the ground, <laughs> I read in my senior year of college. Uh, and I was a biology major. And I was in this course on tropical ecology and conservation. And we'd spend the first part of the semester making in research projects that we'd actually perform in the tropical rainforest in Costa Rica. We'd fly away for a couple weeks and bring these projects to life. And I became absolutely obsessed with these creatures. I had to do something with them, at least. And what's so fascinating in particular, I keep saying fascinating, meh. What's cool about these guys is we actually know very little about them. And as a biologist, it's a really exciting place to be, because there's fertile ground for questions everywhere you might look. And to be part of the building of that foundation that we can ask more questions on, it, it, it's a nice place to be in. But then you, can, you see more every little step that you take. You can ask more interesting questions. You can apply it more broadly. So I travel to the rainforest. And I should say, I grew up in the suburbs. I'm a really indoorsy guy. Um, I spent most of my childhood in my basement playing video games, playing bass. 
And so the thought of like exploring, oh, I didn't even say, they're nocturnal. They only come out at night. Um, so now I'm like, OK, I'm going to go to the rainforest, put on a headlamp, and, and just look for these things. I should also say, I and no one else on the course had worked with them before. So no one knows how to find them. No one knows how to handle them, how to work with them. The best we knew is I asked my professor, hey, do you know where to find these guys? And he said, yeah, they really like bathrooms. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to start stalking these bathroom-loving arachnid monsters through the rainforest. So we get to La Selva Biological Station, which my professor described as the Mercedes of field stations in Costa Rica. That's pretty true. It's kind of like a college campus in the middle of the rainforest, and it's an, it's an incredible thing to check out. And there are paved trails that go out through the forest. And at nighttime, it's closed in. It's kind of majestic. It doesn't quite feel real, because you're walking. You can even bike down a path, again, in the middle of the forest in Central America, and with a 200 lumen headlamp strapped on your face. Everything's there. It's kind of present. And we still couldn't find these guys. We were struggling for night after night, just looking, hoping that we could have anyone to work with, really. And then we go back. We read a paper written by my now advisor, spoiler alert, Eileen Hebbets. Hey, Eileen. Um, <laughs> And we saw a reference. She said, these specimens were collected in the Arboretum at La Selva. I was like, this is it. This is it. We can go to the Arboretum. We can find them. It was like a treasure map. And we go there, and they're there. They're on trees. We'd spent days looking. And all of a sudden, boom, exactly, right in this journal article, it said that we'd find them here. And we did find them here. And then we had no idea what we were doing still. <laughs> Because if you think like herding cats is difficult, trying to convince this member of an ancient order of arachnids to move exactly where you want it to so you can try to science with it, it was naive, certainly. But what we wanted to do and just answer in that moment when we had the little experience that we had at the time was just figure out what they like to eat. Even that simple of a question, we don't know about these creatures. And that can be very informative, um, especially in the way that their sensory system has evolved. Say they're catching moths out of midair. They might be sensing air movement. Maybe they're sniffing around for crickets as they're sitting and waiting on a tree trunk. So we wanted to see, are they motivated by particular prey items? Do they like moths? Do they like cockroaches? Do they like crickets? Let's find out. And we thought we could nice and neatly put a couple things on a tree, see maybe it checks one out for a while. Oh, man, that's the one they really like. Cool. And uh, when we promptly figured out that when you scare an amblypidgid, it just hides and doesn't come out. Um, then there you go. All right, well, that's, I guess that's our work for the night. Cool, this isn't going to work out. Um, so we decided, all right, it might be a little more tractable. We might be able to get anything done. If we catch them as best we can, bring them into the lab. We'll, sit, we'll, sit, we'll stare at, a, at them in a terrarium and, and see what happens. And in hindsight, I'm glad it worked out that way. Because as you can tell, I'm a pretty tweaky, jittery dude. Um, and <laughs> being out in an environment that could be so incredibly stimulating, there's constant sound. There's every type of arthropod that you can imagine screaming out all at once in these nighttime choruses. You got dodge venomous snakes crawling around on the ground, bullet ants that could you know, paralyze your hand if they get you good, monkeys crawling around in the treetops, bats flying by in your face. The chance to experience that, which was cool, and then to take them, put them in a little terrarium, see what's going on. I'm grateful for it. Because when I had that chance, I sat down. We put them in a terrarium. They come out of their little refuge that we had set up. And we're going to see how they check out the prey items around them. And they're sitting there. And it comes out. And it just does nothing. <laughs> it just sits there. And with their antenna form legs, just floating around. Kind of like how a snake flicks the air with its tongue and tastes it, just, just there. And then sometimes it would be completely motionless, except for the last couple of joints on it. Like if I could flex my pinkies all around. <laughs> 45 minutes, I stare at this creature. <laughs> nothing, nothing at all. And as soon as we're done, we call time. My research partner says, what the heck was yours doing the whole time? <laughs> It's like, well, wait, wait, what do you mean? She's like, the whole time you were just sitting there, just like, <coughs> oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Frenzy. I looked at my notes. It was just like, it sat there. It moved its legs a little bit. It did this for 20 minutes. Then it kind of twitched a little. Then another 20 minutes of sitting there. <laughs> and I still have that intensity. For some reason, I'm fascinated with these creatures. Well, hopefully, it's relatively clear to you based on what I've just been shrieking for the past, I guess, eight minutes. Um, <laughs> But that level of intensity, when you start from nothing, when you start from just them existing, is such fertile ground for work. Once you see them for the first time open their face claws and grab prey, once you see them actually vibrate their antenna form legs at each other for the first time, that passion just gets greater and greater and greater. And so I'm trying to hold on to that as best I can. Certainly, I've become a little more jaded in two years of working with these guys. But 
getting to see something for the first time. It's a real thing. It doesn't come up often where someone, some person, anyone in this room can be the first to make an observation, can be the first to study a whole new line of research. And that can open up doors and doors and doors, infinite questions, really. I mean, it's, at this point, I'm waving my hands constantly. But <laughs> it's really, for me, been a simple matter of I'm really into these things. And I think that they can tell us a lot about ourselves and a lot about the world around us. And in a way, we're all doing that, certainly. So they keep on keeping on. I don't have an ending. That's it. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Questions?